Welcome to the Nathan Crane Podcast. Nathan is a certified holistic cancer coach, 20-time award-winning documentary filmmaker, competitive CrossFit athlete, and best-selling author of Becoming Cancer-Free. With nearly two decades in independent natural health research and education, Nathan shares his top solutions for preventing and overcoming disease while optimizing health and improving human performance. Each week, Nathan brings on highly renowned experts to share natural and holistic health science, strategies, and breakthroughs for living your healthiest, happiest, and most fulfilling life. And now, here's Nathan Crane. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for joining me here. I am happy to bring on Robert Burkirk, who is a multidisciplinary scientist, researcher, educator, and regulatory expert with nearly 40 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, academia, and also as a consultant. He has an MSc and a PhD from Imperial College London, where he continued as a postdoctoral research fellow for further seven years, working on projects in Africa as well as Asia. In 2002, Dr. Burkirk founded the nonprofit Alliance for Natural Health International. You can look at their website, A nhinternational.org. He's acted as its executive and scientific director. Uh, ANH has been at the forefront of protecting and promoting natural and regenerative health approaches internationally. Here's a few highlights I want to share with you, and hopefully Robert will get to talk about some of these things in depth mm. that the ANH has been directly involved in helping make happen. They Pass, they help pass the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, which is the law under which supplements are regulated. Uh, they filed nine precedent-setting lawsuits against the FDA establishing qualified health claims for dietary supplements. Then uh, you guys successfully sued the FDA to allow certain qualified health claims relating to cancer for selenium, vitamin C, and vitamin E. You guys won a lawsuit allowing for the communication of importance of consuming folate during pregnancy. Over 1.3 million messages to policymakers in support of legislation calling for Congress to allow free speech about the benefits of supplements. BOM Wonderful was sued by the FTC. You supported their defense to defend free speech about their products' benefits. You had submitted a citizen's petition to the FDA calling for the addition of pneumonia warning on all proton proton pump inhibitors. You've helped to bring greater price transparency at hospitals, culminating in administrative rule requiring hospitals to post an online list of their standard charges. And you have an amazing YouTube channel. People haven't seen it, go check it out and subscribe, where you put up great two videos videos about different issues that are happening in the environment and in the natural health space and, and different things that we as individuals can, can do about it and looking at different ways to pass new legislation, basically to help people live a healthier, more vital, natural life. And so I love the work that you've been doing through the ANH for a long time. I had to dive into some of these and a lot of other topics with you uh, in this in this podcast. So Robert, thank you so much for joining me here. Nathan, it's absolute treat to be with you. I want to ask you about the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. So that is basically the act that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that prevents supplement companies from making false claims on supplements. Isn't that right? Well, yeah. It, it, look, it's a much wider regulatory regime that covers dietary su all kinds of dietary supplements. The what a lot of people around today hadn't realized is that actually there was a plan leading up to 1994 when it was passed to actually medicalize supplements. So when you say we've been involved since that time, original precursor, our organization has, has had three different names. So the American Preventative Medical Association then became the Health Freedom Association, the American Health Freedom Association, and then it became Alliance for Natural Health USA. Back in 1902, the FDA was getting into the habit of raiding doctors' offices. Jonathan Wright, who was one of our co-founders, you may know Jonathan Wright from the Tahoma Clinic, had been prescribing high dose nutrients for cancer patients and to for all sorts of different conditions. And the FDA raided his office, confiscated a whole bunch of things, never held him culpable, but took tens of thousands of, of dollars worth of, of stock, tried to darken his reputation, but found him guilty of no crime at all. And this was this was um, part of the process. And of course, you will, on the lead up, you may know that there were more citizens writing to Congress than on any other issue on the lead up. And of course, the trade associations have historically been somewhat split over some of these regulatory issues. But of course, that's partially because there are pharmaceutical 
interests involved in the dietary supplement area. In fact, most of the cheap, low-cost supplements that are selling in CBC, Walmarts, etc., made by the pharma industry. So for them, they love the idea of dumbed-down supplements that really don't do anything too profound to the body, and it allows them to control if they can get rid of the innovators, all well and good. A small group of companies got together, and that's when, if you haven't seen the famous Mel Gibson ad, there's an ad in which that was released on US television on the lead up to Deche being passed that was central to changing public opinion on this. And basically a SWAT team invades his house and grabs him and arrests him. And they grab a bottle of vitamin C and then he he holds it up as, as he's being handcuffed and says like vitamin C, like in orange juice. Um, that was the plan. Essentially, when you look at these issues with a, a long lens, what you see is everything just goes in cycles. Flexner report 1910 was this huge progression of removing all sorts of alternatives and setting up a system that actually to this day rem remains central to the way in which the pharmaceutical industry and the main mainstream medical establishment do healthcare. Cover that in depth in previous podcasts and in my documentary right. series as well. I'm, you're talking about Abraham yeah. Flexner, who was basically right. uh, sent out by, I think he was the, the nephew of either Carnegie or yeah, Rockefeller? Carnegie. Yeah. Carnegie. Carnegie. And, yeah. Carnegie and Rockefeller were working together during that time yeah. in the early 1900s, yeah. basically to go out and get their, get control over medicine as we know it, right? And sent right. out Abraham Flexner to go out and basically put a, put a report together and say, these hospitals and doctors and or these these institutions colleges and so forth at the time they're teaching medicine these are the ones that are teaching good medicine which was yep. basically pharmacology you know drugs etc and these only only about 30 of them survived i mean they literally it was just a massive cleanup operation yeah and they went in and then they said these ones are basically teaching quackery which was like natural medicine that had a lot of you know safety and, eff and efficacy behind it but they said natural medicine Nope, these guys are bad. Uh, you know, anything that has drugs involved in it, these guys are good. And then they started funding and they, they got someone on the board of all of those institutions and they said, hey, we will continue to fund you and give you more money if you follow the things we want you to do, which is use more pharmacology and implement, you know, the scientific method as we want it done. And it was really all about money and power and control. I mean, they were invested heavily in the oil industry and they found out, hey, you can make all these uh, pharmaceutical drugs from oil byproducts. And so it's another use, another way to basically make billions of dollars over decades. And you control, you basically create a medicine monopoly. And it was it was a really devastating thing that happened for human health, in my opinion, because for a really long time, anyone who practiced any kind of natural medicine, which has been around for thousands of years, by the way, I mean, go back to TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, Qigong, acupuncture, all of these kinds of practices have been around for a very, very long time and very well understood and practiced with safety and effectiveness. And they said, hey, if you do any of this chiropractic, anything, you're a quack and it's not real and there's no science behind it. And it really, I think it's taken up until, you know, the last few decades for a larger percentage of human population to be much more open to natural medicine. And I think COVID actually helped open up a lot more people. And there's many reasons. I mean, yes, as you've described, it's not too different today. The attack on December 2022, the latest guidance from the FDA on home homeopathic products says, guys, all that homeopathy you're using, every bit of it is illegal, which is kind of the warning signal that they're going to go after it. The attack on NMN, we're, we're really very seriously considering a legal action uh, in conjunction with the Natural Products Association, who we do absolutely see eye to eye on this issue in order to attack the, the FDA's stance on that, which is all about investigational new drugs. Who gets there first? Do you have evidence that the product was on sale as a dietary supplement before someone decided that they want to investigate as a drug. And essentially, the situation at the moment is that the FDA holds a loaded gun. They've got a loaded gun given to them by law that allows them to use it completely arbitrarily. And obviously, we see a big issue arising with CBD. Again, all of the wins, all of the benefits that anyone who's alive today really has been able to make use of in terms of applying these natural products to their health have come because these fights have been won by the grassroots. At a and I think we are the 
the largest grassroots organization working on these issues. Um, I also head up our international office based in the UK from where I'm talking to you now. If we take the example of homeopathy, Germany's the home, Hanahan, the home 200, over 200 years ago. Homeopathy has just been made illegal to be prescribed by medical doctors who are the key prescribers of homeopathic products. So they've just been Jeez. disconnected from that modality. So these challenges happen in waves. Where did this um, happen? In Germany. In Germany, so the, the, they just made yeah. it illegal. It made it illegal for a medical doctor to prescribe a homeopathic product. I mean, is there not a safer form of medicine today than homeopathy? I mean, seriously. Like, other, see, than, other than placebo, like, homeopathy is the most safest thing somebody could do, from what I it understand. It doesn't fit. It. It, you know, when you come from a pharmacological mindset, you, you'll see them trying to get their heads around it. First of all, they're, they're also so some some cowboys out there who are selling things that they call homeopathic products that actually have measurable active ingredient in them. A true homeopathic product, of course, is an extreme dilution yeah. that has a signature of the molecule that was in there left in a substance we call water that turns out to be one of the most sophisticated substances out there that we're only just beginning to really understand more about. Yeah, I mean, you've diluted, you've diluted it so much that you can't even find in testing that particular molecule that's in the homeopathic remedy. But what we're understanding from a quantum is that it's it's the energy. It's the energy of the molecule. And so yeah. like to go after that and make it illegal, because and there are peer-reviewed, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials that I have reviewed from PubMed that have yeah. shown homeopathic medicines that outwin, that win yeah. against placebos. And five, five, five meta-analyses and systematic reviews, four out of five of them show absolute more than placebo effect for, for homeopathics. The only one that doesn't has got the Shangadal study, which which is completely duped in order to give the wrong results. But we're seeing, and of course, one of the reasons homeopathy is also under attack, it's one of the big winners during the three years of COVID. The amount of benefit, you, you'll see it out there on social media, you'll, you'll find it when people are talking to each other. And that's partially because a combination of things that we've been exposed to, extreme stress, a virus that it turns out as 99% likely come out of a lab through gain of function research and mRNA vaccinations. If you measure these on bioenergy devices, you'll see they do one thing. They substantially lower the resonance of the human being that we can now measure through the human biofield. And of course, energy medicine and homeopathy is just another branch of energy medicine does is help raise that resonance. The body is desperately trying to heal itself all the time and it needs, it needs support it needs nudges. And what we're really discovering as we integrate the knowledge of biophysics with biochemistry and biology is that the, the field, the energetic field that is part of who we are, actually takes precedence over anything. And any of the biochemical reactions and the direction of those biochemical reactions within our bodies are the result of direction from the field. So if you don't correct the field and you're only using a biochemical approach, you, you'll only be dealing with part of the problem. And of course, there's many ways in which we can um, restore that biofield. But, you know, the great thing is that the, the technologies to be able to measure this and are, are really more and more available. That's not to say that, um, you know, we've done a big analysis of some of them recently. And there are still some technologies out there that are very unproven and somewhat shaky scientifically. But there are also some that have really been tried and tested and provide incredibly valuable information about the human body. I want to put a pin in the first question about the Dietary Supplement Act. So basically, Basically, what is the big win from that, from what I understand, is the big win is that it, it opened, it broadened our ability to label ingredients and, and certain you know natural ingredients and components as supplements so that they couldn't necessarily be completely uh, taken over by pharmaceutical companies and only turned into drugs. Because when they do that, then they like there, it seems like they're trying to do with NMN, you know, nicotinamide, which I take as a supplement, by the way. Um, and there's a lot of incredible studies behind it as a supplement that it that act that you helped the organizations helped pass actually helped protect our rights and ability as citizens to have access to natural ingredient based supplements it created a carve out that kept them as a subcategory of food and also recognized that they had structure function effects so what they had to develop is a mechanism by which there was a, a clear difference between the treatment 
treatment and the prevention of disease as opposed to a molecular structure that has a specific function. And of course, that um, whole process wasn't because Deshay in itself has many provisions that have yet to be implemented. One of them that was implemented more recently that had a, a fairly big impact on many companies was the CGMP rule to require you know good manufacturing practice and all the conditions around that. Hey, I just want to take a quick second and thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you're enjoying it so far. As a special thank you for tuning into this episode, I want to give you my number one Amazon best-selling book absolutely free. You can go download it right now at becomingcancerfree.com. If you want to learn evidence-based strategies for helping your body become a cancer-fighting machine for not only cancer reversal but cancer prevention, go grab a copy of the book. Again, I'm just giving it to you for free. You can go download it at becomingcancerfree.com. All right, let's get back to the show. So some of the less established players had great difficulty getting their head around that. Now, in itself, that's not so bad. But what we see is that there are steps being taken all the time that are creating a very, very slippery slope. In a perfect world, if you look at the evidence from trials and from clinical data that has come out of COVID, you'll see that amongst the most, the strongest evidence, if you do forest plots of all, all the results, actually natural medicines did phenomenally well during the COVID era, you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, quercetin. Look, there was a, there was a meeting in, in um, DC between the 24th and 26th of May put on by the Nobel Prize Summit. And um, it was basically the game plan for how they're going to deal with what they call scientific misinformation. And in essence, Nobel is the sort of apparent sort of uh, gold crown, crown jewel in academia that, that hands out Nobel Prize. Um, is going to be involved in that process alongside leading universities, the Yales, the Harvards, etc., the Russell Group in the UK. And these universities whose funding sources are very closely linked to companies that have extreme vested interests in, in pharmaceuticals, vaccine technologies, etc., will make that decision. Everything else will be deemed scientific misinformation, and they will be using artificial intelligence intelligence to track all of the scientific misinformation under those criteria down and get rid of it and uh, destroy the reputations of people who are essentially dissenters. Now, that fundamentally means that the principle of scientific discourse that has allowed us to get this far, that has allowed, you know, ideas, hypotheses, beliefs to be tested experimentally, to then be published, to be exposed to peers, to then have it discussed so that only the stuff that stands up to scrutiny ends up kind of surviving the day, all that goes because we'll, and, and of course, that's why we would tie this process. This process is, is very, very joined up. It's not just happening in the US. Nobel is European. A lot of the universities that are engaging with it are international. And it is part of a joined up international strategy that is delivering the same kind of recipe. And it is a recipe of, at very least, authoritarian in Crete, in which the administrative states become ever more powerful, but actually it's moving probably clo closer to a totalitarian system. Um, no, so I've, I'll go ahead. Finish. deeply troubling in terms of if you value science, I've spent my life, I've got three science degrees. I've been to one of the top universities, both for my master's, my PhD, seven years of postdoc there at Imperial College and turned down tenure there to set up the Alliance for Natural Health back in 2002. And it's a, it's a pitiful situation for us to find ourselves in and many of us are doing in the natural health movement is coming together to say look enough is enough we need to create this kind of carve out both in law which is why we're so active in the political space with congress particularly with federal laws in the u.s we need to take strategic legal actions when the regulators overstep their mark and um, we'll do it with anyone who's doing it in an appropriate fashion but most importantly we need to make sure we have the grassroots on board because when the grassroots start picking up the paving slabs, that's when they start taking notice. That's what happened with Deshay. It's what's happened with all the revolutions that have maintained the kind of civil liberties that we are just about still able to enjoy today. 
So that's that's literally what I was going to ask you. A couple of things. One, as a scientist, what has been your conclusion and, and how have you felt and what have you thought basically from 2020 through now about what we're being told is the scientific process where we're being told by Fauci on TV that yeah. basically I am the science and if you don't believe in me, you don't believe in science. You know, all those things that we saw the last few years. One, as a scientist, what's your perspective on that. Number two, as kind of a follow up to that, what is ANH doing or what are you guys planning to do to address that, if if anything? Okay. So first of all, this the stuff we hear about follow the science is it's a story. It's it's little more than a story. It doesn't really stack up because if you look at any of the literature on the philosophy of science and the development of science over history, and you look at how particular scientists who have tended to be dissenters, you know, Einstein. Tesla, Da Vinci, all these people were not born from the cloth of the mainstream. They were thinking outside the box. They were daring to go outside the comfort zone of the realms of established science. And they were moving into the unknown. So one of the shocking things that have happened to me over the last three years is the intolerance for uncertainty. It was interesting that the the, the Nobel Summit meeting decided to use two key examples to show why why it needs to take control of what is appropriate scientific information and what is scientific disinformation or misinformation. And the, the two issues they chose, one was COVID, the other one was climate change. And what you've got with these issues is um, complexity for a start. They are, they're not just complicated, they are highly complex. In other words, they have a mass of interacting factors that means that what happens, say, in sub-Saharan Africa is not going to be the same as what happens in California or Tennessee or or in, you know, Venezuela. When we get to this situation of trying to polarize views into almost a binary perspective, where it's either completely right or it's completely wrong. So on the climate change front, the debate is, is there anthropogenic? Is there human mediated impacts on climate change? And they seem to be asking, is the answer yes or no? With COVID, the situation is, is there, is natural immunity capable of doing anything? Or do we have to rely on a new technology that's never been used before on mass population? And they managed by not using the scientific method, by using complex behavioral psychology to persuade the vast majority of people that actually technology held the solution. So we've got this real problem in terms of people trying to look at a complex issue being pushed towards a binary solution, you know, a, if you like a Teflon PFAS coated track that has got lots of attraction around it. It's about ensuring that the belonging need, the safety need, is one of these fundamental human needs that human beings have, is satisfied. And for Christ's sakes, don't step on the other track because it's dangerous. It's unsafe. You're going to be challenged. You'll be a horrendous conspiracy theorist. How can you live with yourself? How can you deal with the guilt of not non-compliance? Um, now, that isn't, that isn't science because science has been born out of discourse and dissent. And it's the stuff that sticks at the end of the day that starts creating this rich tapestry of what we call knowledge. But our knowledge at any one point is limited. So that's why we've got to ask ourselves the question is, you know, what are we as humans? As humans, culturally, are we happy to keep looking for a technological fix? Or as Charles Eisenstein would say, guys, we, we've become addicted to technology. You know, we coming back to the discussion we had earlier about Flexner, um, of course, course, there were people who saw the issue from both sides back then. But of course, where people started getting a little bit um, lazy was after the big successes post-World War II with, with antibiotics. So we saw penicillin coming along. We saw the um, promotion of, of, uh, of vaccines uh, against smallpox. These were the original type of vaccine, very, very different technology to mRNA technology used now for, for COVID and increasing the other, other diseases. So you had some very clear successes that showed, wow, there is such a, and they had DDT in agriculture. They had a few hooks that they could sell to the public to say, look, forget about this nature thing. It's very backward. It's old fashioned. Let's go for the, the new technology. Now that system 80 years on has run out of steam. You know, we saw from the 2010s, the, the drug pipeline becoming empty, the patent cliff for a lot of the major lipid lower 
brain drugs, etc. Statins, big sellers. We saw the horrendous problems with Vioxx and SSRIs creating, and, and of course, then we move into the opioid crisis. And we now seem to be in the situation. I mean, if you look up the criminal suits that have been laid at the door of the pharmaceutical industry, it's quite remarkable that so many people can still put their trust in the pharmaceutical industry to find a solution. And one of the reasons we find ourselves in a bit of a tight spot right now with the NMNs, the CBDs, you know, and even homeopathy is because they want ground. Their, their pipeline is getting empty. There is no doubt that the new technology for them is in the realm of synthetic biology, and it's moving increasingly away from the idea of a biochemical molecule that is usually a ripoff of something that happened in nature. 75% of all pharmaceuticals originate from nature. They're then tweaked, they're separated from their sort of natural family of chemistries in which they occur in nature. And um, and the tweaking of them is what um, creates the huge problem with iatrogenic effects, uh, making properly prescribed medicines now the third leading cause of death in America. So we need to, coming back to your second question about what do we do about it, the starting point is education. We have to help people to understand that to some degree, the information that they've assumed to be correct information, this idea of putting your trust in these large corporations that have revolving doors with regulators, possibly not the best thing to do if you really value your health. And in fact, if you look at all of the available science, um, even the World Health Organization has had to agree with this um, in different at different times in different places, is that the biggest impact on our health are social and environmental determinants of health. Any illness we get is not a deficiency of a pharmaceutical. It's because something about the way we're living in this modern world, the poor adaptation we have is problematic in order to get self-healing properties running properly. So the natural medicine world um, has huge amount to offer. Many of the leaders who are um, developing strategy on behalf of the pharmaceutical industry, as well as the elites that are controlling this march towards totalitarianism, know this very, very well. They use it themselves for, for themselves and their own family. So there's, this is a critical time for humanity. We're also, as Eisenstein and others are saying, we're living at a time where it's not just the healthcare system that's collapsing. It's social systems. It is economic systems. It's financial systems. And, you know, if you look at C.S. Hollick, the ecologist who developed the adaptive cycle, he explains just how everything in nature, but also all human societies, all human technologies will go through a process that follows a figure of eight, where you get an exploitation cycle, a conservation cycle, a release cycle, and then you get this overwintering phase where you you rebuild, like like in winter when you see no leaves on the trees, it looks like nothing's happening. But there's a huge amount of work going on in nature that gets ready for the next spring. And I believe that's where we are right now. And that's why we have to be thinking really hard. What direction do we want to go in? We need to hang on to every civil liberty we have, because bet your bottom dollar, literally, they will try and take it away from us in order to control us. I want to share a couple of things here on based on what you just said. First is anybody who knows systems systems theory and the S curve in the systems just to kind of highlight a little bit of what you said as well we you know off you know systems go through systems in the universe systems in business systems and in, in this case you know in healthcare and technology etc they go through these S curves where first they start and then they build over time and then they stagnate and they either start to start to head downward and at that point you have to make changes for it to go up to the next level or it's going to fall off and basically die or become something completely different uh, this is a good example, if you can see this, of what's called the innovation window after that period of growth in the S-curve. And, and what I hope uh, happens is that the the way we've known medicine uh, for the last hundred years, what we call conventional medicine, um, transitions through this next S-curve cycle and transitions into something much more holistic and, um, and really looks at the entire human body as we do in natural medicine. But as medicine as a whole, I really hope that it begins over the next few decades to embody a holistic view.
viewpoint because we will then absolutely 100% believe we will see a drastic improvement in human health everywhere on the planet, which solves a lot of issues. But I also want to share something else that you said. I've shared this chart before on the podcast, but for those who haven't seen it, when you talked about the amount of criminal fines for the top pharmaceutical companies, um, you can find this at Violation Tracker. People can find this on their own. But since 2000, the year 2000, so we're only talking 23 years, there's been a hundred and thirteen billion dollars paid out um, for from these pharmaceutical companies over 1200 records of payments made for all kinds of things from Johnson Johnson to Pfizer to Merck all the top GlaxoSmithKline etc for everything from product safety violations to complete scientific fraud to off-label unapproved promotion of medical products uh, drug or medical equipment safety violation everything you can think of um, in terms of paying paying kickbacks to doctors illegally, falsifying data, falsifying science, false claims, um, you name it. They have been fined and have paid massive settlements. And you mentioned Vioxx earlier. We know at least 50,000 people were killed by Vioxx. Um, there are some estimates that it's over 100,000 people. And what happens when when this happens, when these companies put out a drug that they, there are internal memos that are showing that people inside the company knew that it would cause heart problems and would kill people and they put the drugs out anyway. And what happens is these companies get fined a few billion dollars, they get a slap on the wrist, the drug gets pulled off the market, and the pharmaceutical company can go on forward continuing making more drugs and making more billions of dollars. The government basically finds them and keeps that money for themselves. And these criminal organizations called pharmaceutical companies, we're supposed to trust them, we're supposed to believe that everything they do is for our health and for our betterment, and they get to continue making drugs after falsifying data and paying billions of dollars in fines. It is it is absurd. To, I mean, when you say that out loud and you really look into this, it is it, it feels like you're living in some crazy movie. Like there's no well, way this could be allowed in real life. And yet this has yeah. been going on for decades. Look, absolutely. And if it was only the pharma industry, it wouldn't be so bad. The problem is it's the food industry. It's the agrochemical industry. And it's also the telecoms industry. I mean, while everyone was, in lockdown, if you follow the number of, and I know Elon Musk has had a, a significant contribution to this, but you follow the number of satellites that have been put into Earth orbit during the time everyone was locked down as they prepare for the next generation technologies issuing frequencies to which life on planet Earth is not adapted. Digital frequency has a waveform that's very irregular, that's very different from the smooth sine curve that natural systems emit. We, we're all emitting radiation all the time. We receive obviously a lot of radiation from the sun, but also cosmic radiation. The earth is issuing its own Schumann resonance living thing radiates energy. But we've had millions of years to adapt to that. You bring in technology, digital technology, which we're being told exactly. Hey, I just want to pause a second and ask you, are you enjoying this episode so far? Are you getting good value from this content? If so, then I know you're going to absolutely love Healing Life. At HealingLife.net, you get exclusive and premier access to hundreds of the top world's doctors, experts, cancer conquerors, and survivors. Exclusive interviews that I have done with all these experts and doctors uh, that are not available for free online. They're only available at HealingLife.net. So not only do you get access to all of those, but you actually get to speak with these doctors and experts and ask them any question you want about health and healing. And this is available exclusively to Healing Life members. You can try it out for free. Go to healinglife.net and you can start your free trial there. And uh, whether you're interested in learning more about detox or cancer, diet and nutrition and nutritional science, about diabetes, about heart disease, autoimmune disease, anti-aging, longevity, all of these topics are covered in depth and more are continuing to be added at Healing Life. And again, you get to talk to these doctors yourself. So I invite you to set up a free trial at healinglife.net and I hope to see you over there. Now, let's get back to the show.
I want to show this chart as yeah. you're talking, the number of yeah. active satellites from 1957 to 2022. You can see how few, you know, by 2017, there were, by 2018, there were 2,000 satellites over those 50, 60 years. And then look at this as it's in 2020, 2021 and 2022, look how it's literally triples. So there's, there's years. some good, good science coming out of Germany showing that some of this spontaneous, very large mortalities that you're seeing on bird populations, many people will have noticed that it's bird populations and insect populations that are absolutely central to life on the planet in terms of diversity and biomass on the planet. They're just plummeting right now, the free fall and biodiversity. I mean, one of the reasons that, again, the system is trying to focus people's mind on climate change is because it doesn't want people to focus on the real environmental problem that's going on, which is habitat destruction and biodiversity loss, which is also linked to deforestation and everything else. That's Listen. where the problem, but they, they don't have a tech fix for that. So they right. don't really want us to know. And because they are much more interested in a technological future in which you can circumvent what they see as limitations of the human being, they are, you'll see there's a whole literature, there are university departments setting up all over the world on transhumanism or human augmentation, which is really what synthetic biology is a part of. Right, which is very scary to think of. Now, I have really mixed feelings about Elon Musk because, number one, I really think he's a genius, and I really think he cares about humanity. I feel that when I, I've listened to a lot of his interviews, and I think he's really brilliant, and I think he cares about people. But then you look at something like Starlink, and I know the reason behind Starlink from at least from what he says is is one you know he wants to make internet accessible to the billions of people who don't have access to internet so they can many of the same communication connections and luxuries that, that we have in let's say first world and second world countries that have easy internet access he wants to make it available to people all over the world in remote areas and so he put up over 4000 satellites in the last few years his starlink is a one of the major contributors to putting up those satellites all over the world. But when I've heard him, so I think he cares about helping people. I also know he cares about making billions of dollars. He wouldn't do that if for him it wasn't about the business. But I also, I've seen him on Joe Rogan say Wi-Fi and EMFs, he laughed at it, said there's absolutely nothing to worry about. They don't cause cancer. They don't have problems. They do nothing to you which is 100% false. Yeah. I have done entire presentations with Lloyd Burrell where we covered immense amounts of data and science that show not only radiation EMS from cell phones, but from internet, Wi-Fi routers, and so forth, damage the DNA, damage the cellular structure, damage can lead to chronic inflammation and can lead to cellular disruption, can lead to cancer proliferation. There is enough evidence today, scientific, scientifically verified evidence, as well as many anecdotes and case studies and people who you see a lot of gliomas, for example, on the same side of the brain where people hold their phone. You, you see, see bre breast cancers in women, for women who put, 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 the, the, put the phone into, right into the bra, bra and keep keep it there yeah. every day exactly so i mean keep the phone you know i always keep the phone on the table away we work closely with with um ollie johansson and some of the guys who were right in the forefront of the most rigorous research they had huge grants from ericsson and other people as they started determining that the non-thermal effects of emfs were so damaging they had all their grants pulled and um, you've just put your finger on what I think is Elon Musk's very weak point. You know, he, if it interferes with business, it's not enough of a concern for him to be truthful about an issue. I mean, for example, he knew full well that he was raping sub-Saharan Africa to get his cobalt and his lithium and everything else, creating a, 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 a children's slave trade that was at least as bad as the black diamond trade during the diamond era in southern africa but he was mute on it and he was saying look these tesla vehicles you know with all their batteries in them um are, are going to save the world with knowing full well where he's getting the resources from we're now going to be i mean you'll see that 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 technological fix that all the early adopters jumped in on is not the fix that all it did was was bypass yeah if you live in a in a very uh, dense population area you can improve the air quality in that city if you have a bunch of evs but you have absolutely no net impact when most of the energy that's required that's coming to 
to first of all build the vehicle, build the battery, recycle the battery, and then run the battery is coming from fossil fuels or right. renewables that that are much less renewable than the data. You know, what one of the things we don't do well around this whole area because people are so lost in the addiction of these technological fixes is do life cycle analysis. If you're going to make a decision to buy an EV, A, you've got to look at the entire life cycle to see what's going on. And B, you've got to check where your data is coming from in the first place. I mean, it's the same kind of mischief occurs with consumption of animals if we're going to look at it in, in terms of carbon. So people are saying, well, eating beef, really bad for the environment. They're belching and farting and doing all this stuff. Well, it's really interesting. If you look at a pasture-raised animal system, you know, we've looked at um, data very closely in the UK at the Aberdeen Angus stock in Scotland and the Welsh lamb stock in Wales. When you measure carbon that is both being sequestered or released by the animals and sequestered both into the pasture as well as into the soil, particularly into the rhizosphere, the microbiome. Cows and sheep are already can be carbon neutral. Therefore, telling everyone that these animals are bad for the environment is right. another lie. No, it depends insane. on the context. You put them into a factory farming system, it's a very different... Si so they take Absolutely. the data from the factory farming system and say this applies everywhere. But again, what are we dealing with? This issue of nuances and of complexity... Everyone seems to want a simple solution. So hell, just become vegan and you'll save the world. It's nice right. and easy to live with. Right. And we, I mean, anybody who's ever spent time out in nature uh, or done any research into true environmentalism, you, know, you have environmental extremists who think you got to get rid of all the animals and humans are bad for the planet, um, which humans, yes, we, we are destroying the planet, but it doesn't mean we are bad for the planet. We need to get rid of humans. And also because animals can destroy the planet based on the context you just gave doesn't mean that they are bad for the planet. And in fact, you know, Yellowstone, I grew up in Montana, Bozeman, Montana, and spent a lot of time outside as a kid. And uh, even though I've been, you know, whole food plant-based vegan for over a decade, I grew up on, grew up hunting and fishing and meat and potatoes and all of that. And I saw firsthand the importance of animals on the land. My aunt had a ranch and branding on cows and they raise these cows in, you know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres of, of farm, of fields. And it's the animal on the earth in the right proportions that help keep the earth sustainable and regenerative. Look at Yellowstone, what happened when they took all the wolves out. They took the they took the predators out. They took the carnivores out. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the park started getting destroyed because the herbivores grew in too much mass population. You can't have that extreme out of balance. You can't take out that important aspect of nature, the carnivores, to keep the herbivores moving throughout the land. And that's what they do. That's that natural cycle. And so the park was getting completely destroyed. Well, they reintroduced the wolves and guess what? Um, in a pretty short period of time, the forestry got back under control. And so we need animals on the land. But like you said, these giant factory animal agricultural uh, farms, those are terrible for the animals. They're terrible for the land. Just drive across Texas, as I've done in doing my documentaries on sustainability and go look at these factory farms where they have thousands of cows in one little tiny area. There's no grass to be seen anywhere. You're just driving by. It's just all black because the dirt is just all black. There's not an ounce of, of grass anywhere. There's no way that's healthy for the planet. But you put and the ter animals. Ter terrible, the terrible land. for humans. The people terrible for humans too. Plus well, they're well, pumping them full. Ter terrible all around. And and again, that that's the strength of education. And people can understand that if they want to eat meat, they want to think carefully about where it comes from and what kind of system it comes from. And they might want to eat a bit less of it. And um, th this brings us to another closely related issue, which is this idea of having a one-size-fits-all solution. If you kind of look at a part of the world that has a lot of marginal land um, and you ban animals from it, actually, the maintenance of that marginal land comes for the reasons that you just described, the animals grazing on it and pooping on it, actually putting some organic matter that is partially recycled back into the system, keeping it vital. You cannot grow arable crops. If they want a solution where everyone's eating whole grains uh, and they're growing it in monoculture, that could be much more destructive to to the environment. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And you know, this is why I've studied permaculture, as I'm sure you have. Uh, studied permaculture for the past ten years, and permaculture.
culture gives us the design blueprint for how to live in harmony with animals and nature and the land and growing food in a regenerative and sustainable way. And it doesn't mean getting rid of the animals. It means living in harmony with the animals and growing foods in harmony with each other that actually builds soil and creates abundance. These food forests, Jeff Lawton, I'm sure you've probably heard of him from Australia, or from New Zealand, I believe, who's got some great videos out there. I've been following him for years. I've experimented with permaculture as well in our previous property. And it's really learning how to, look, how do we grow food sustainably and regeneratively without chemicals? That is the way nature intended. And it's a pretty amazing thing to see. I mean, one tiny example people might relate to is, is the Three Sisters. This is, I spent a lot of time with Native Americans over the years. And the Three Sisters are a very common Native American food crop that they've grown for thousands of years, which is corn, beans, and squash. And so corn is the stock that, uh, that grows upwards. The beans are the nitrogen fixers, but nitrogen in the soil and the beans grow up around the stock and the squash lays ground cover uh, with the leaves and grows along the ground and helps keep the water in the soil. And so it's a tiny example of how you grow companion plants together in harmony with each other to be more productive. And actually, if you do something like that, corn, beans, and squash, uh, not only are you fixing nitrogen back into the soil and helping repair the soil, but you are creating more abundance and more food per, per hectare per acre than just doing a terrible mono crop, which is going to destroy the land. Um, and there we have these things accessible to us. And there nice are and more farms within, that are converting to these regenerative yeah. styles in the US yeah. anyway, which is pretty amazing. And they're actually I'm, going from making less per yield per crop on monocultures with uh, GMOs, and then they switch to organic and they switch to regenerative agriculture, and they are increasing their price per yield substantially. So we know it's more financially viable, but we also know it's more sustainable. Uh, absolutely. Within five meters of me right now is some um, garden here at our the ANH office, and we have exactly that permaculture system. That's My lunch was a hundred percent derived from our garden here. These are choices that in many parts of the world everyone has what we call a kitchen garden. You've got some space, and one of the things that because um, my background is in sustainable agriculture, that my academic background, so it's uh, trying to maintain this complexity in the system is a critical part of it. I think the the bit that we need to help more people in the so-called industrialized countries understand is the the benefit of them seed saving, starting with an organic seed, but then basically setting about 10% of their crop aside to be able to collect seed. And one of the biggest problems we have is that we are tending to cultivate crops that are not epigenetically adapted to the area that we're growing them in. Right. And um, once you've got about three cycles of that crop going through that area, through histone modifications, methylation, the, the, the critical systems used for epigenetic marking, those crops become better suited. So, you know, 25 years ago, I was working in Eastern and Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, Central Asia on different cropping systems from cotton to vegetables. Uh, one of the tasks that we had is to understand why these conventional farming systems were breaking down. And sometimes they'd be using so-called resistant varieties. So you can get a resistant variety of cabbage that is developed for use in Northern Europe coming from a, a Danish supplier that has a fantastic natural resistance, say, against cabbage aphid or, or Plutella xylostella, caterpillar that attacks crucifers. Um, you take that crop to Africa and that resistance breaks down. So when we started looking at it, we thought, well, what the hell is going on here? So we were measuring the chemistry in the plant, looking at the glucosinolates and all the um, secondary metabolites. And um, lo and behold, they were there. And it's only when you start looking using electron microscopy that you see what happens in the uplands of, of Kenya that we were working in. Um, the is, it the, UV... is, it, is it the microbes in the soil? I'm going to take a guess. No, no, it's not. It's, no. The, it's the ultraviolet light at high altitude in the tropics oh. that create because it's the waxy cuticle that actually provides the primary resistance mechanism for many of these so-called resistant um, crucifers. So, and that completely breaks down. Now, as far as the agricultural suppliers were concerned, they said, no worries, we'll sell you the seed from Denmark <laughs> and we'll send you, sell you pesticides. No problem. They make a pack of money out of it. But then the plants basically fall apart after a few years. The, you know, you've got a system that's chemically dependent. Exactly. 
Um, I want to go back to talking about Starlink and Elon Musk. I know they've put up close to 5,000 satellites, something like that, in the last couple of years alone. Uh, from what I've read, their plan is to put up something like 42,000 satellites. We know from plenty of scientific studies that EMFs do damage DNA and can lead to chronic inflammatory conditions like cancer in the body. How do you, what, how do you look at that and what do we do about somebody as powerful and and wealthy um, and who's coming across as, hey, saving the world here by giving everybody internet access, but at the same time, knowing that we're going to be, you know, rained upon with these EMFs from thousands of satellites around the world, no matter where we are. I like to go out into nature, turn off my phone, turn off laptops, go with the kids and the family and go camping for a few days at a time to get away from EMFs and get away from technology and just be in nature. And the concern is you won't even be able to do that. And so how do you look at that and, and what do you what do you think we can well, do about I, it? I think we need to again look back at history and see Nathan you'll know, know that we've been in the middle of a, a, a campaign on PFAS um, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances these are organofluorine compounds and um, Teflon forever, is one example forever of, chemicals forever right? chemicals yeah forever chemicals and um, so I mean we, we took kale from four different states organic and non-organic and found 90% of the samples were contaminated with significant levels hundred to 250 parts per trillion, which is way over what the EPA regard the safe level. Um, and the FDA is telling us, on the other hand, don't worry, guys, we've been studying um, PFAS and the food supply through the TDS, the total diet study since 2019. And uh, interestingly, the, their data stops in 2021. They still haven't published their 2022 data. Um, and they say 97% of the samples that they've looked at um, are free of PFAS. And the only areas that they see a problem is in seafood and um, they found one protein powder that was contaminated um, a little bit of, of red meat but basically plant foods clear so we just decided to dip our toe in the water to do twice the number of samples that the FDA has looked at, at one crop that's you know the archetypical healthy food kale as it happens I did my PhD on the crucifer system so I know quite a lot about them and and I also know that that one of the interesting things with crucifers and, and with kale is that you have relatively high protein content for a non-leguminous plant. And we know that PFAS, an affinity to protein. So to be frank, we were completely and utterly shocked. We went through one of the best, most accredited labs, Eurofins, using FDA testing methods. We used collection bags that were from Eurofins that are guaranteed to be PFAS free, because of course you can get it through contact materials as well. In the process of looking much deeper at what appears to be a major issue. Now there was a few months back, there was a in May, there was a big study published going back to historic data acquired through freedom of information requests that shows that the chemical industry, the likes of DuPont and 3M, have known exactly how serious in terms of birth defects, cancers, fertility issues, the whole works, because actually the range of health impacts of PFAS chemicals, of which there are over 12,000, which are now completely ubiquitous, they're omnipresent. Look at the CDC data, you'll see that now they're saying PFAS are present in 100% people. So we've got exactly the same problem with these chemicals. That's one group of compounds, and they're playing a whack-a-mole game with it. They're saying, oh, look, we'll pull PFOA, pull a couple of them, so, and of course, they substitute for another. We saw that happen with BPA, BPA and exactly. bis bisphenols. So, and yeah, um, and you buy plastic that says BPA-free, and you're like, oh, great, this is healthy plastic. And no, it's not. The plastic exactly. has literally hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of other chemicals in it, some of them known endocrine disruptors, known hormone disruptors, known uh, yeah. to be likely or potentially carcinogenic cancer causing. So, so we, we need to see a total ban. What well, one thing that all PFAS compounds, they have different chain length, but they have this carbon fluorine bond that's about the strongest bond known in chemistry. And you've got a shorter chain. Yes, it breaks down more quickly, it's slightly less persistent in the environment. But we have a mass problem with PFAS. Biden and, and Harris uh, administration are just jumping on it, but they're trying to give the impression that, look, we are just looking at um, aquifer contamination around DuPont and 3M manufacturing plants. Um, US Geological Society has just come out with a study that says 45% of all the tap water in the USA is contaminated with PFAS. So that kind of gives us an indication of why the CDC data is saying that every American is now contaminated with PFAS. Now, if we combine that chemical, that's just one group of chemicals. We're actually 
actually insulted by, we're exposed to maybe 20,000 different industrial chemicals every day. We combine that with the new to nature EMF load that we're going to be getting as they start to beam this down. Now, you asked, how is this all going to change? You know, when is Elon Musk going to wake up to the fact that that um, um, telecommunications could result in very significant problems in terms of creating imbalances, not just for humans, but all the other organisms that benefit from them. So one of the reasons that we often will look to birds and insects is because those kind of organisms are very dependent on using geomagnetic fields for orientation, for for being able to locate and, and orientate and, and, and journey and reproduce and everything else. So, and it may be that when we see this free fall in bird and insect populations, EMFs have something to do with it. But we also know that, you know, neonicotinoid pesticides have something to do with it. So wherever we look, it's always multifactorial. Can't pin any one thing down. And what we need is kind of, you know, our view is that we need to have a nature-driven approach to it, where we actually think carefully. Nature's always several steps ahead of humans. One of the reasons that the doomsday predictions have often failed is because the planet, this, what James Lovelock called Gaia, is an or- is an organism unto itself. And um, one of the most active parts of that organism is actually the microbial world, of which we're only just starting to understand. And that microbial world doesn't just exist in the soil and in our bodies. The, the place where most of it exists is in the ocean. And it's also the place where most viruses live, in the ocean. All the unseen elements, yes, people know about the destruction of the rainforest, but they know less about the impact of the acidification of the oceans, changes to the phytoplankton within the oceans that are creating a knock-on effect on the entire stability of the planet. But if you add that to what's happening in soils and the the fact that monoculture, arable agriculture, which is put forward as a central part of the planetary health diet that came forward in the Eat Lancet study, requires much, much more arable land, which is going to also be treated with glyphosate that's also going to wipe out the whole microbial environment. That's the difficulty if you don't move to a polyculture system that is epigenetically adapted to specific localities and regions. We, we need diversity, not simplicity. Yeah, and we need people like Elon Musk to wake up, just like you said, uh, and others who are, well, maybe they know what they're doing and they, they don't care. I mean, who knows? I but don't change until the consensus is so great that they say, you know, it, the whole conspiracy theory agenda that's really grown in magnitude over the last three years is a very useful tool because it allows you to shoehorn dissent into this realm of conspiracy theory so you can ignore it. And it's only when that sort of jumps out of that harbor that it moves into mainstream accepted, generally accepted knowledge that they will take action. So it gives them a few years to make hay while the sun shines. I want to give some people some hope about (laughs) the the exposure to toxins. I actually have a a webinar uh, I'm teaching. I've spent the last few months researching for this new web class. And then and then we have a masterclass, a detox masterclass. But I want to give people a few things that, that they can, I mean, the work, you know, you're doing through A&H and through the legal side is incredibly important because that's how we're going to make a big change. But also in that it needs people awake and aware of what's going on in our exposure to these toxins. I mean, another toxin that's mm-hmm. ubiquitous in water systems and drinking water around the United States is atrazine, one of the top herbicides that is still, has been banned in many other countries. I think it's been banned in the UK, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Where it's still allowed here in the United water. States. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the studies they did on atrazine showed that 75% of the male frogs that were exposed to the atrazine became, they lost their ability to produce sperm. They basically became chemically castrated. And then one out of 10 of those frogs literally was switched from male to female. We know that atrazine is an endocrine disruptor. It disrupts our hormones and who knows exactly everything it's doing to humans. And it's in the drinking water, uh, along with these PFAS that are, you know, these forever chemicals that are in the drinking water and they're, they're making their way into the food and so forth. So the first thing I tell people is one, we can take charge of a lot of this, get involved at a, at a level and support ongoing petitions and things like that to, to change the laws and to ban these kinds of chemicals. But also personally, you know, you can filter your water, you can filter your air, you can make sure you're buying as much local organically grown food as possible. You can filter the water that you're like, I have a hose out back where I water our garden and I filter that hose. I buy a filter and filter it. So you're, you're reducing, you're not going to completely eliminate your exposure to all
all these toxins. You can reduce it. I mean, a tr their, Berkey has done studies with their charcoal filters that you can reduce 99.9% .9 of atrazine and herbicides and pesticides and PFAS and these kinds of chemicals from the water. Well, I think water is one of the, our drinking water, shower water, the water we're brushing our teeth with, pushing, putting on our hands, etc., is one of the most thing, you know ubiquitous things that we put in our body every single day that is exposed to all these kinds of chemicals. So simple, good, high and quality. We are, and we are water. And, and, and we are and, water, 70% water, I mean. And, and that water carries so much information in oh terms gosh. of history. So if it's, if it's run through a municipal waste treatment plant, you know, seven times in a day, which is what can happen in a city when you turn the tap on, it's got a lot of information in it. Um, you know, there's Silicon Valley guys are, are, are looking less at silicon and more at water because water has the capacity to store way more information. So one day, I'm pretty sure we will have water water-based computers. Mm. It's no surprise that we are water-based organisms for exactly that reason. Exactly. Because if th there are no organisms out there that, that are not wet and squelchy. Um, there are no dry organisms. We see um, dry abiotic things. We Obviously, viruses are, are dry. They don't have a cell structure. They don't have a nucleus. They have nucleic acid that's often wrapped in a protein coat. So they, and again, when we are brains, we're always kind of looking to put things in compartment. Are they living or non-living? Well, um, in my mind, I, I put them in a continuum between living and not living. They depend on other organisms for their energy as a host for their own reproduction, but they've got other qualities about them that are much closer to living organisms. And of course, there are only around 200 viruses that have ever been shown to cause disease. And there are probably multiple million viruses out there, as I said earlier, many of which occur in the oceans um, that we're starting to, using next-gen sequencing, understand a bit more about. But um, I come from from a, a perspective from evolutionary biology where we see viruses as really largely the good guys who are involved in a system of genetic exchange that is actually critical for evolution. And of course, this is one of the problems when you have a fear-based campaign around, um, a, again, a function research program that created SARS-CoV-2 is that everyone becomes fearful of viruses. Everyone wants to wipe right. them out. And, right. and yet, you know, that, that kind of thinking also often often um, goes across to any kind of germ or bacteria. Again, these are the saviors for the planet. We really have to understand much more about microbes. Yes, they're small, but they undergo incredibly complex functions um, in and around other organisms, keeping the biosphere, the planet stable. Well, as I'm sure you know, I mean, we have more bacterial DNA in our bodies than we do human right. DNA. We require viruses and bacteria to live as human beings, and science is just starting to touch the tip of the iceberg of what these bacteria and viruses are doing in our body to keep this homeostasis. But I wanted to just kind of put a pin in the point of giving people some some things they can do is, you know, filter your water, um, buy as much organic as possible, especially when you're putting lotions and shampoos and things on your body. There are so many chemicals in those everyday body care products that are completely allowed, even though they are known endocrine disruptors, they can cause all kinds of organ damage, they can lead to cancer in the body. So you You've got to buy anything you put on your body becomes your body, literally at a cellular level. It gets absorbed through the skin into your bloodstream, often bypassing filtration organs. So you bring lotions and deodorants and shampoos and soaps and things like this. Make sure they are pure organic with no chemicals added to them. Super, super important to reduce your exposure to these chemicals. Filter the air. I already said filter the water. And then you can take natural binders and chelators, kind of clean up the gut. You can also things as improving your immune system function, vitamin C, glutathione, vitamin D, these kinds of things that are going to help your natural uh, detoxify, uh, detoxification pathways help to, you know, stimulate your lymphatic system like exercise. Sauna is wonderful as well. Sauna is going to help, you know, remove um, heavy metals through your sweat. It's been tested and studied that, you know, doing sauna not only increases lifespan and reduces all-cause mortality by up to 45% um, in the relative uh, risk reduction in those studies, uh, I think it's like 18% absolute risk reduction, which is amazing, by the way. But it's been shown to chelate out heavy metals through the sweat. Also, natural binders. There's activated charcoal. There is cilantro, spirulina. There is parsley, things that are going to bind to some of these toxins and chemicals and remove them out of the body. But, you you know, you've got to look into this at a much deeper level. I mean, we have hours and hours of content of how you can detox safely. But I just want to give people hope that you can reduce your exposure significantly. You can live.
live a lifestyle where your body is removing a lot of these chemicals out of you every single day. But at some point, we've got to stop putting them in completely and stop yeah. putting them on the earth and, and harming you know <clears throat> ourselves and animals and plants as we know it. So I wanted to ask you about, oh, I wanted to mention, do you know Dr. Henry Ely, E-A-L-Y, with Energetic Health Institute? I don't, know. So he would be someone, I'd be happy to connect you with him. He, brilliant, brilliant scientist, has, is, is part of an organization, nonprofit. They are, and they have support from Stand for Health Freedom. I do, yes, I do. Yeah, so they have okay. support from Stand for Health Freedom, uh, where they've ra- they've gotten, I think, 100,000 signatures, where they have filed a formal grand jury peti- petition calling for the investigation into the CDC's willful misconduct to hyperinflate the COVID-19 data, um, where they have proof, and I've talked with him in depth. You can find my entire interview with him on Rumble, Dr. Henry Ely, where he says they have proof. He thinks they will absolutely win, where they broke the federal laws uh, in multiple cases. Cases, but they are getting the hundreds of thousands of people on board signing the petition and, and they need more people to sign and then also to donate to help for the lawyers. 100% of the donations go towards paying for the legal fees to help. This is one of those things that you mentioned earlier, the ANH wants to partner and support with anyone who is helping move forward the laws that help stop these kinds of things like willful misconduct from our governmental health organizations from being able to to happen ever again. He has the the evidence to show that they hyperinflated the case count for the intention to get the emergency use authorization to then you know fast track the jab forward um, against even the evidence that showed that there were solutions already in place. And if this lawsuit goes to the grand, uh, it will go to the grand jury if they win, which he really thinks they will. Um, it could drastically make a dent in these like the CDC's ability as well as HHS's ability to allow something like this to ever happen again. Well, so Nathan, if you haven't looked into it, I highly recommend, you know, looking at we'll definitely, it. definitely follow that up. Um, during the COVID era, I've, I've been based um, in, in Europe. So we've been all over the European data and European groups, but that's new to me, but definitely we will follow that up. It sounds, sounds fascinating. The, the, one of the difficulties is that, as you will know, the judicial system isn't always as fair as it's cracked up to be when you get involved into in matters of science debates over science they've got a very well-oiled system of wheeling out experts that seem as i was talking about the the nobel prize summit kind of people are associated with that who come out of the fauci mold they just keep saying the same old thing over and over again until people start believing it but um, legal actions are absolutely essential there are still some decent people left in the judiciary my hope is that um, during the day in court, um, Stand for Health Freedom will have the, the right kind of a hearing because it's, I mean, it's clearly a, a manipulation as is so much of what we hear about through the mainstream media. And that, that is the difficulty that the corporatocracy has now got itself neatly glued together with the globalization agenda that have a particular view of the world um, where things are seen through a lens of top-down control when it comes to pandemic, um, top-down control when it comes to delivery of um, of uh, substances that are used for healthcare purposes, which is why they need to sideline dietary supplements, and also a particular view of the environmental crisis that we are no doubt in the midst of, but they want to show us a part of it that, that is really not the part that we should all be focusing on. And that's why, from a sort of empowerment point of view, to be able to not comply where there are clear, fragrant removal of fundamental civil liberties that are father mothers and forefathers and mothers have fought for, we need to be able to kind of put a, a stick firmly in the stand and say enough is enough. And But we also need to create new systems. So yeah. what's fascinating at the moment, just come out of a, a weekend of many of the groups who are looking at new economic systems, financial systems, agricultural systems, educational systems, and healthcare systems, we were leaders on the healthcare side, are coming together to say, with the collapse of these multiple systems, we have to start building building the new because the the picture that the 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 guys in charge as it were have for us is is one that that is um deviates dramatically from a path that's kind of in tune with the essence of what it is to be human as well as having that connection with nature that we are a part of i love that building the new i've been uh, talking about that and and experimenting with it and spreading information
information about it since 2011, 2012, when I recognized that's exactly what we need to do is build the new societies, the new communities, the new you know way of, of growing food, the, the create the systems and the cultures in place. So when all these things collapse, we already have all of this functioning. And there's some good small examples of it happening in various parts of the world, but nothing at large, at any kind of large scale yet. And um, but, but, ex- but you I'm, see, we don't necessarily this this is the key. If there's one word that ties all the solutions together, in my view, is decentralization. Everyone seems to be looking for a large scale solution that can apply to everyone. But that's more of one size fits all. Actually, many of the s- solutions are about creating connection between the different nodes that are appropriate for different regions, different cultures, different ethnicities, different age groups. We need diversity in the system. We don't need to be all shoehorned into the same system. That's true. And um, so small solutions, it's again, the same applies to some of the groups who are working on environmental issues. Some of the best work is being done by specific groups that are going out to parts of India saving tigers in one area. I mean, compared with what the World Wildlife Fund is doing, these smaller groups, if you look at them all together, are doing much more than WWF that is absorbing massive amounts of money in the bureaucracy, the administration, and then supporting SDGs and all the rest of it. So decentralization, really, really key. Local solutions, really key. Empowerment, protecting, defending civil liberties, absolutely crucial. And being able to have communication systems that work. I mean, that's one of the reasons that social media systems, which is, if you like, the communication system for the people, are now being so heavily controlled. And again, Elon Musk, you know, with X, what used to be Twitter, there are many people still being cancelled who are scientists and doctors providing perfectly reasonable system, whether it's algorithms that are legacy algorithms from the pre-Musk era that are still having their effect. But, you know, we, we're, we're seeing any growth we get, it's almost to the exact number, they just delete people from your account. And there are lots of people we know. It's shadow banning. There's a huge amount of shadow banning that's going on. Um, and that's why moving back to live events like the camp out event we've just had um, mm. so important so that we can really get our ideas together and start working in connected groups decentralized groups dealing with all of these new systems so it's a, it's a really exciting time to be around I, I personally think we're all around here because of this this is this was our calling I mean I'm finding myself using all 45 years of my professional background because it's it's so multidisciplinary it's so interconnected it's so necessary that we see things from a a kind of bird's eye view as holistic systems as we started talking about at the beginning and we need to get out of our silos and we need to stop thinking there's a technological fix around the corner right nature has so many of the answers exactly and speaking of you know live events i'm on the uh i volunteer on the board of directors for the beljansky foundation we do scientific research into natural solutions for cancer and chronic disease and we have a conference coming up the integrative cancer conference in october in jacksonville florida with people flying in from all over the world to attend in person as you said i'm one of them and you'll be there and you know this is it's important we get together in person there's also live stream tickets available for people they can learn about the conference integrativecancerconference.com but the uh, one of the reasons that your organization uh, one of the reasons you're coming and and we're excited for you to come and be a part of it is the work that the ANH and you through the ANH has done over the years is so instrumental in helping move this important work forward into the future. So your organization and, and yourself are being honored with a nonprofit excellence award at the conference, which is going to be a pretty awesome experience. There's entertainment. Thank, thank you, Nathan. We're, we're hugely grateful. And, and um, Beljansky's work, it, it was groundbreaking. The work that the foundation is still doing is, is amazing. It's a very difficult environment to operate in and, and uh, you know it's fantastic to have someone like you associated with it as well yeah thank you and it's it's important work that we like you said it's different groups approaching it from different angles all over the place all, that's that's exactly what it is the decentralization we're approaching it and I have been for the past decade from the cancer viewpoint but that all ties into sustainability into the environment into our food into holistic systems and systems of entire civilization but at the same time we can produce and publish science that shows hey nature plant 
plants from nature actually are helping our bodies into homeostasis by fighting off cancer cells. Look, we just have one more piece of evidence to keep educating and sharing with people these natural solutions for our health with zero or low or no toxic effect on healthy cells. So anyway, integrativecancerconference.com for people interested, check it out. Come uh, come meet Robert and myself in person or well as as well as a couple dozen other incredible integrative, holistic, functional, natural physicians and doctors and cancer conquerors. There's going to be presentations and workshops and music and vendors. It's going to be amazing. So uh, those of you who are watching, please come join us. But I wanted to ask you, I mean, we've kind of danced around it um, just naturally. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really interested in your perspective about climate change as a scientist who clearly cares about the environment. And myself, I deeply, deeply care about the environment. Um, my perspective on it has shifted over the last few years, whereas before I was much more one way and now I'm seeing it from a larger holistic viewpoint. What is your perspective on climate change? Um, again, the story that we're being sold, I don't think fits with all of the information that we're given. And, um, and a big part of it is because the story that we're sold revolves specifically around carbon and carbon dioxide. Um, and doesn't then consider the way in which carbon and carbon dioxide, when you look at really long timescales, has been changing um, dramatically and how what kind of buffer the planet is capable of dealing with, particularly through the plant world and the microbial world. And I think it's like a very limited um, view of a much bigger, what I would like to term an environmental crisis. I would say we are going through an environmental crisis. Um, we, we've actually created a big infographic on it, too, and we've written a, a piece on it, um, tries to put climate, so-called climate change, into context. I think it's it's something of a misnomer as well, um, and because climate is always changing. Um, and I think it, it's a technique to take our minds off the real problems that are occurring around habitat destruction, um, chemical pollution. I mean, if you like, could argue um, pollution from vehicles and from industry or from agriculture is just an another form of chemical pollution. We're releasing excessive amounts of certain gases um, that can destabilize the planet. We're also got to look at that in the context of all the chemicals that we tend to ignore. I mean, the, ke the chemicals are, are such a huge part of the overall problem, um, as is the problems that are going on in the oceans. So um, environmental crisis, yes, manipulation of data. Uh, the, the story we're, we're told is, is really typically any of these issues, as you look at them develop over time, they will give the public a problem, define it in a particular way and offer a solution that's very close to it. Now, the solution... And then, who benef that, and then the question yeah. always is who benefits the most from that solution? Yeah. If you follow yeah. the money, when it's you say who benefits the, the most, you will always find, yeah, the money funnels to a few key people and a few key organizations from yeah. that particular solution from that so-called myopic problem, which is almost always much more than just that little thing that they're focusing on. Exactly. There is a strong link between the climate change agenda and the development of, say, central bank digital currency and carbon bonds and this, um, even the ESG agenda, environmental social governance agenda that's that's um, become part of the, the kind of woke kind of culture that, as you know, is, fortunately, some of the lead players are starting to say, realize that it is just part of an agenda that's pushing people on this Teflon stream that really really has very little to do with solving the planet's real problem. It's, it's like in healthcare. We, you know, if we were going to have a healthcare system that really cared about people, it would deal with the social and environmental determinants of health. It would deal with the, the fact that most people are eating wrong diets because the food system has manipulated the USDA in order to create a kind of food pyramid, a my plate system that benefit, you know, ultra processed food industry. Coming back to the solutions, um, I loved all of your solutions just a couple more that we can add to that. Getting color into your diet, getting all the major phytonutrient groups into your diet every single day is a, is a huge part of it. Getting diversity. I mean, you see the quality of the food that people are eating. It's the same thing day in, day out, often yellow in color, missing all the antioxidants, the paranthocyanidins that, that are so crucial that mop up radical oxygen species in, in, in the body. But we've also got a crisis around mental health, term mental 
health is used all the time, particularly around young people that are being made to become addicted to digital technology. So we need to kind of reframe how we're going to be handling technology and addiction to technology for young people and work with human emotions. Because um, we know from both psychology, neurolinguistic programming, as well as now biophysics, that every single thought we have, you know, carries energy with it that has impacts on our body. So the fact that people are living in a, a world dogged by fear, by anger, by disgust, these are all primary emotions, emotions that have been built into human evolution because they affect directly our survival. And they're being manipulated by the players um, every day of the week. They're being disseminated through the media and they affect our bodies because of the way we're thinking. As soon as we say, look, let those guys, chances of us being able to directly fight the system. And if we look, for example, the WHO treaty that's going through at the moment with going to be signed up by a majority probably in May 2024 next year, they're playing a game to basically hand sovereign control in the event of a pandemic can be declared at any time by someone like Tedros when he decides, you know, monkeypox becomes a pandemic of concern. And they will then determine our future in terms of what we should or shouldn't do in Geneva, not in Michigan or Pennsylvania or California or the United Kingdom. That's assuming the countries sign up to it. They're going for lots of small countries that realize that if they play the game, they're going to get their IMF loans. They're going to get their trade deals. So these countries are just signing up. So is that stoppable? My view, and it sounds negative, is probably it isn't. But what is stoppable is the ability for them to be able to control the decisions that we make on a day-to-day basis. That is why the First and Second Amendments exist in the in the Constitution. We need our freedom of speech and we need to be able to have tools to be able to respond to a system that forces us to violate those fundamental inalienable um, rights that we have. Um, they cannot be taken from us. And um, one of our fundamental rights is our connection, not just with each other, but also with nature. And there are many of us who will, who will never give up that fight. That is, um, and whether it's going to become a fight, my hope is that it's not something we have to fight for. It's something that becomes a natural progression that enough people understand, which is why at this stage of the game, education is such a crucial factor. That's why we're joining with James, Dr. James Lyons Weiler in the States through the through IPAC, the Institute for Pure and Applied Knowledge, through our NH Health Creation Faculty. And we're working on all sorts of um, retraining. You learn stuff that you find is incorrect, for example, the view on climate change or the view on all we need is a vaccine to get ourselves through COVID. We then have to unlearn that, but we need to relearn that. What James is releasing through IPAC hyphen edu.org um, is really reasonably priced courses that allow you to learn about the immune system, learn biology and chemistry in the way that it should be taught, not the way that we get. You know, if you look at what happens in schools these days, they're all being turned into technologists, not biologists or ecologists. They have no real idea of how the natural world works. They want to take that information away from us so we can just all engage in technological solutions. So we have to start teaching ourselves. And we are already seeing the spawning of new institutes like IPAC that are going to reteach some of these fundamental sciences that we need to understand um, to a degree to be able to understand the value of the kind of solutions you and I have been talking about for the last hour and a half. Yeah, absolutely. Improving our education systems is essential. And as we kind of come to a close here, I wanted to share briefly how my thoughts have shifted on climate change over the years, Please. Yeah. where I, I think I believed everything that was put out initially um, with some reservation, because anytime there is a, you know, a, a governmental organization telling us this is the way it is, I have certainly some hesitation or reservation to believe everything they say. But in terms of I believed a lot of what was put out early on when I became aware of it was, yes, you know, we're damaging the planet. Yes, it's contributing to the climate changing. Is it actually contributing to global warming or not? That, you know, I, I saw early on scientists disagreeing with that. So I said, okay, there's some disagreement there, even though the mainstream media and the government organizations are saying, hey, 99% of scientists agree on this. Again, I didn't believe that number was true either. But either way, over the years, what I have come to to believe is that number one, 
our destruction through the massive chemical production and through you know the vehicles and the batteries and the toxic things that we produce you know whether it's technologies and so forth we are absolutely destroying the planet there's been no doubt about that in my mind whatsoever we are polluting the waters we are killing the fish we are killing the coral reefs we are putting these toxins and forever chemicals into the plants and into the water streams and into our drinking water and so on and so forth there's been no doubt about that in my mind since day one so it's like yes we are destroying the planet are we actually contributing to what they call climate change meaning you know larger storms that are going to kill and destroy more people and the melting of the polar ice caps and the waters raising and all the end of the world you know uh hypotheses that has been sold to us as fact if you don't change these things and go to all electric vehicles by you know an electric energy by 2030 you know humanity is doomed all of those kinds of statistics and doom and gloom things that have been told to us a lot of that i've been very very skeptical since the beginning i'm even significantly more skeptical now but with that said here's the challenge in my mind just because even if you believe let's say somebody is watching and they they 100 believe we have no impact on climate change whatsoever let's say that's your belief right human beings and and the co2 and all of that and there are scientists who are saying this and believe this as well that we can't do produce enough co2 to actually make a change in climate climate's always going to change the, the temperatures go up and down and go up and down over centuries and centuries you can check out the graphs and find that that's true but let's say you believe that humans cannot change the climate. To me, that doesn't matter as much as the fact that if we keep going the way we're going, we are going to continue destroying ourselves, the natural environment and the animals and our foods with all of the chemicals and toxins and pollutants and technologies that we're creating. Batteries have to go somewhere. You know, right now they're being piled up at Tesla saying, hey, they're going to be recycled. But how many of them actually are getting recycled from all the EVs and how many are ending up in landfills and poisoning the the waterways and the food systems and so forth you know we don't have those exact numbers yet how much of the pollution is going to continue causing da irreparable damage to our ecosystems that's the the thing that i look at and say hey we are causing problems let's recognize that and then let's figure out what can we do about it and these are the solutions we've been talking about on this podcast you've been talking about you've spent many years focusing on this and i think the big takeaway for me is whether climate change is actually happening or not there is is something we can do about stopping the destruction and the pollution to our own selves and our children and our families and our communities. And that is becoming more in harmony with nature, growing more of our own food, cleaning up our water systems, choosing organic, supporting local organic farmers as much as possible. Stop buying things that are filled with chemicals and preservatives and junk in them. Stop buying these fake meats that are being produced and these GMO crops and these things that are like, they're saying, yeah, eat fake meat that's grown in a laboratory because it's better for the environment. BS, it's going to destroy your body. These are things that are not natural for our human biology. And so getting ourselves closer and closer to nature, the more we can do spending more time outside in nature, getting our kids to spend more time outside in nature. I think these are real solutions individual people can do every single day. Nathan, it turns out that we're 100% aligned with our views on, on the environment. It's really interesting because in America, what I, what I also find is that a lot of people's views on environmental issues are affected by the political divide. You know, if you, if you vote Republican or, or Democrat, you tend to have um, views that reflect that political view. And I find that strange in itself because your political view should be independent of what's happening outdoors and right. in the environment and everything else. But I think what it cements in our mind is that there is huge uncertainty about what's really going on there. Um, some of it is beyond um, human comprehension, particularly the ability for um, Gaia, for the planet to be able to um, survive stresses. But there are also a bunch of factors going on that very few people are talking about, such as, for example, this shift in the magnetic pole. The, the magnetic pole is moving, the true magnetic north is moving well away from the magnetic north that we like to think of in our map, moving at around six miles a year, which is pretty quickly and the true magnetic north is sitting somewhere in the middle of Siberia at the moment and there is a possibility that we're moving towards a polar flip. Now that has very significant impacts on any animal that is using the Earth's magnetic fields to assist with orientation or mate finding or anything else. 
but it also is going to have an impact on the melting of the ice cap. So these kind of transitions, they they happen, but it, it seems that not only are many of the human systems transitioning at the moment, there is a major transition going on with the Earth's magnetism as well, which right. has got to be factored into um, the overall picture. So complexity is what it's about. We have to become more tolerant of an uncertain environment. We have to be not so quick to immediately shut people down who have a different set of views. We've got to become better active listeners so that we can say, look, there are a bunch of things that we might not agree on right now. And that's because there's a lot of uncertain data out there. But there's probably some things that we do agree on. And the very things that you've been listing, listing in terms of having more time in nature, um, educating our kids to, to be kind to each other, to, to understand more more about how the world um, works to um, be able to eat whole foods that don't come out of a plastic container to understand the provenance of every piece of food that you put in your mouth um, to not buy foods that have ingredients lists as long as a laundry list if, it, right. if you don't understand what the hell it is don't put it in your mouth you know to put pressure on the political system to exercise your democratic right to understand that the people in congress are there because they are doing your job to to enact your will and to make the corporations on this planet today answerable for their misdeeds. I mean, they are, it's an extraordinary situation, as you rightly listed previously, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry that has been entrusted with human health is the, the, the most criminal industry that the planet has ever seen. And the average person still just rocks up at their family physician says, what are you going to prescribe me for this pain? I've got my left knee. It, I mean, it's, it's entirely crazy if we don't reframe what's going on. And that's why having a sense of, you know, changing the locus of control, part of the movement that we've seen over the last three years through this pandemic was about orchestrating a change in the locus in, of control. You know, in healthcare, we were all getting super excited about this idea that the doctor-patient relationship is really where it was all centrally important, that the patient was going to be at the heart of everything. And and now you've got doctors looking over their shoulders saying, I've got to I've got to see what the FDA what the FDA is telling me to do. I've got to see what my medical board, because if I don't comply with that, I might not have the food to feed my family. Now right. Right. that's become healthcare. Right. You know? Dad. Um, crazy. So we we have to reframe, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't. Well, Robert, um, this has been an awesome conversation, really. Uh, definitely enjoyed it. You're you're obviously very brilliant, and um, yeah, I'm, I I mean, you just provide a whole long list of things that people can do as well. So you know, leaving on a positive note for people, <laughs> there is a lot of hope. There's a lot we can do, um, and we have to be diligent and vigilant and and focused and committed. I mean, these things for me, it's become a lifestyle and it's not work. It's like, this is how I live my life and I have for years and it's how I will continue to live my life and continue to find ways to improve while still living in this technological world and having a foot in this world and having a foot the best I can in the natural world, trying to help people and help my own family at the same time. It's like, you do what you can. And that's, that's it. You do what you can a little bit every day, do what you can. And millions of people doing that, it will make a significant difference. So uh, Robert, if people want to get in touch with you, support your work, your organization, donate yep. to, to the ANH, where's the best place for them to go? ANH-USA.org. That's our website. Um, our international website is ANHinternational.org. But for a US audience, ANH-USA.org. And um, there's loads of information you can get involved. We the, the most important thing that people can do is sign up to our free newsletter. And then you'll see the information. We, we are um, the biggest grassroots organization in this space, making change around um, laws and regulations and working with, with Congress. We've got a lot of support there with many of the issues. And um, we also do take legal actions. We provide a lot of information that is educational as well. On, on key issues. But our website is the best way of finding out more about us. And please sign up to our newsletter, www.anh-usa.org. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, like I said, it's been an excellent conversation. I really appreciate it. 
uh, this time with you and uh, look forward to, um, you know, seeing you, diving see, deep, see, seeing you see in you October. In, yeah. In October. Absolutely. Can't wait. Um, Nathan, it's been great talking with you. Um, awesome. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Nathan Crane podcast. Please make sure to subscribe and share this on social media. Then head over to NathanCrane.com for your free ebook. So when we're talking about, you know, what are these underlying causes and conditions of these chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, they all have very similar, if not identical causes. And that's the thing is when we get to the root cause of these diseases, we can not only prevent these diseases from ever happening, but empower our bodies to heal from them. In every one of our cells, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions that are happening every second that are cycling uh, back and forth. And it's like sort of a, a yin and yang. And you know, for me, the soul, soul's purpose is evolution. It doesn't care about comfort, it cares about evolution. Mm. And so I think so long as we are following our soul, then we will evolve. And I think what sometimes blocks us from living our purpose, from manifesting that next level of our expression, is we have not evolved. There is also a time for letting go all the expectations and relax and just breathe and be grateful for what you have achieved.